Welcome back to Othello by William Shakespeare. Uh, if you're looking for Act 1, Scene 1, or a bit of an introduction, if you go back to my playlist on, on this channel, you will actually see uh, the beginning of Act 1. But here today we are going to finish Act 1, so we're going to start with Act 1, Scene 2. Now previously in Act 1, Scene 1, we're setting up the major conflict of Desdemona has eloped, she has run off with Othello, um, Iago has decided that he has needed to be promoted over Michael Cassio, um, and so with uh, everybody that we've seen here from Brabantio to Rod Rodrigo, Iago, a lot of people are very upset with Othello right now and they'd like some answers. So that's why you can see in the characters in Act 1, Scene 2, we have Othello here, but we also have Iago, Cassio, Rodrigo, Brabantio, and we have an officer as well. So there needs to be some answers given here by Othello. So in Act 1, Scene 2, a little bit of a summary, Iago warns that Brabantio may use his influence to have Othello arrested and to have his marriage dissolved. But Othello is confident that his reputation and loyal royal breeding make him a suitable match for Desdemona. Now, Cassio we see for the first time, he brings a message from the Duke who urgently needs Othello at a meeting. Now, Othello and his soldiers are then accosted by Brabantio and his followers, wondering where Desdemona is. And Othello commands the men to put away their weapons and denies Brabantio's accusations that he has somehow bewitched Desdemona. Now, Brabantio decides to go to the council meeting with Othello so he can inform, inform the Duke of Othello's treachery towards him. So once again, we're looking at very upset, angry people at Othello, so we're going to be look at, looking at Shakespearean insults. Now, the coarse imagery that Iago used to describe the sexual union of Othello and Desdemona in Act 1, Scene 1, it continues into Scene 2. Now, Iago compares the marriage of Othello and Desdemona to that of a pirate who has boarded a treasure ship. Now, Othello has boarded a land carrick, he says. Now, the racial insults also continue to fly when Brabantio cannot believe that his beautiful, privileged daughter would voluntarily run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such a thing as thou. So, of course, then this negative language is dehumanizing to Othello. So this is the first time we meet our main character of Othello, and so we get some first impressions of him, so we're going to look a little bit at the character. Which of the following descriptions best matches the images of Othello given to him in Act 1, Scene 1? Since we don't see him in Act 1, Scene 1, we know that he has to be what he is described as, and so he's an untrustworthy stranger in the eyes of Brabantio. Uh, he is a moor, an exotic figure, dangerous and unreliable, if you listen to Iago. He's a man for whom sexual desire is paramount, again, if you're listening to Iago, because Iago just constantly insults him left and right. And the sexual insults are coming because he's talking to Brabantio about his daughter Desdemona. He obviously is a man with enemies, but he's also a dangerous man. Othello has the power to decide who gets to be uh, his next in command, and so he's decided on Mac Michael Cassio versus Iago, so he definitely has a man with enemies in Iago here, and since he has eloped with Desdemona, he probably also has now made an enemy with Brabantio. So when we take a look at some of the other descriptions that I've put down, do you think Shakespeare's creating two opposing images of Othello in the first two scenes? Because when we look at him, he looks like some of the other impressions. He's obviously a worthy soldier. The Duke has asked for him to come back because he needs to go to an important meeting. He approaches the angry uh, Iago and Brabantio as a calm, measured, statesman-like man, a man of high principles. He allows Brabantio to follow him back to the Duke because he feels he's in the right. He was in love with Desdemona. Desdemona's in love with him. Yeah, come on back with me. Let's go talk to the Duke. He must be an exotic and attractive figure. After all, he's won over the heart of Desdemona. Michael Cassio, who is... Uh, his soldier underneath him seems to be uh, quite respectful towards him. He's a highly respected leader in this point. So there's an interesting opposing image of Othello from what we hear about him in Act 1, Scene 1, and what we see in Act 1, Scene 2.
Moving on to Act 1, Scene 3, we have all the same characters as before because they've all followed Othello over to the Duke. And now, of course, because we want to talk about what's going on in Cyprus, we're going to see the Duke and some of his sen senators. We're going to have to sail the army there, so we have a sailor. And then we have other minor characters as well. But as you can see, we still have Brabantio, Othello, Rodrigo, and Iago, who are going to be discussing their concerns. And Desdemona will come in as well. So the summary, well, Othello is told to prepare for war against the Turks. The Turks are coming into Cyprus, and therefore Othello must go and meet them. Now, Brabantio accuses Othello of using witchcraft against Desdemona. After all, he can't believe that Desdemona would actually be in love with this soldier. Now, Othello recounts the history of his relationship with Desdemona, and she is brought into the council in order to confirm his words. Desdemona is so much in love with Othello and wants to show how strong the relationship is that she actually asks to accompany Othello to Cyprus. And so Othello agrees, but he places her in Iago's care. Iago's wife will be coming as well, and so he figures they will watch her. Brabantio warns Othello about trusting Desdemona. After all, this is his daughter. He knows her whims. And so he says, well, if this is to be, I guess it's to be, but be careful about trusting Desdemona. And of course, Iago, ever the person who wants to look like he's a good soldier to Othello, he says he'll help Rodrigo seduce Desdemona and cuckold Othello. So even though he looks like he is willing to help out Othello by watching Desdemona, we have to remember he's trying to work against him. So we get the story about how Othello and Desdemona come together from Othello. And so when we read lines 129 to 171, where it starts, her father loved me and oft invited me, up to here comes the lady, let her witness it, we get Othello's speech. And so it's a little bit of a storytelling. We need to have a little bit of a flashback here from Shakespeare, but he doesn't write in flashback tones. After all, this is supposed to be entertainment for his time and therefore was written in poetry. So he's, he's written it out in a speech. So when you take a look at how he discusses how he wooed Desdemona, you're looking at these vivid and exotic details. You're setting a context for what is about to be revealed about their relationship. Lots of description and, of course, a lot of repetition and recounting. Um, it's helpful for the actor, first of all, with a lot of the repetition um, in order to memorize this long speech, but it's also giving us a sense of that flashback, the recounting of thoughts and feelings and the recounting of what was said. Remember, because this is a speech and it's meant for entertainment purposes, watch for the figurative language that's being used. We got metaphors, similes, alliterations, onomatopoeias, personifications, everything to set up a good description which also gives us a good impression of Othello. He seems to be a very educated, very well-spoken man. Now, Robaccio thinks that Desdemona defies nature in falling in love with Othello. She says, a maiden, she, in spite of nature, everything, to fall in love with what she feared to look upon. Yet here in this long speech, Othello is erudite and poetic in his language. It doesn't seem at all unnatural for a young girl to fall in love with a brave hero soldier. Now, Othello's articulate manner also suggests he's not simply a savage. It subverts the stereotypes of the day. Shakespeare's setting up Othello to be a hero. He needs to look like he has the sense of superiority. He needs to look like he's got everything down. He needs to have leadership qualities. And so when you look at how articulate Othello is, he's our hero-like character in this story. Note to the contrast between Othello's ability to communicate here and the lack of eloquence in communication when he's consumed by jealousy at the end of the play. So when we start getting into our sense of tragic downfall in our hero, you're going to notice the difference between him in Act 1, where he seems to have everything all together, and when he starts falling apart at the end of the play. Again, as we continue looking at that speech about how Othello wooed Desdemona, when we look at some of the words itself, we see that Othello shows, despite his reluctance to em embrace um, as Othello as his son-in-law, Brabantio is still absolutely fascinated by him. Some of the first lines we have, he starts by talking about Brabantio to the Duke. Her father loved me, oft invited me, 
still questioned me the story of my life from year to year, the battles, sieges, and fortunes that I have passed. Now, even though it sounds like he's fascinated by Othello, it's less positive than it first appears because he's essentially othering Othello, considering him as being exotic, exciting. That doesn't quite mean he's equal or he's going to be good material for his daughter. So as we now getting, getting into Desdemona coming in and backing up his story, when, she, when Othello says, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs, Desdemona says she saw Othello's visage in her mind. We're wondering, did they really fall in love? Or are they just in love with the thought of being in love? After all, Desdemona saw Othello's visage in her mind. Maybe she thinks he's quite attractive, but she's looking at the physical components and not at the whole man. And then, of course, she gave me for my pains a world of size. There's a hint in Othello's speech that, again, it's merely physical. Are there hints in Othello's speech that he's charmed by Desdemona's fascination with him rather than Desdemona herself? So if you go back and look at his speech, is he really in love with the woman? Or is he in love with the thought of being in love with what she is? So looking at the language itself, again, we talked about how there's a sense of repetition, how we're looking for things like similes and metaphors and all the different types of figurative language. As you look at the Othello Wu's Desdemona speech, his language is interesting. It's that of the language of a storyteller. He's going to use contrasts and emphasizes the danger of his experiences. He's trying to present himself as the best character he can be, as a hero who can escape deadly terrains. Even though when he's recounting his telling of his stories, however, his language and imagery is quite romantic. It seems like he's already wooed Desdemona. Now he's going to try and woo the father, Brabantio, and the duke as well. You should like me. I'm a hero. And then, of course, if you look at the repetition here, Othello's not only repeating what he told Desdemona, but he's clearly emphasizing his own heroism. How accurate it is? We don't yet know. After all, this is the first time we have really met Othello and are finding out more about his character. Now, as we continue on with the Othello Wu's Desdemona speech, does Shakespeare expect the audience to believe these assertions or view them as boasting? After all, remember, the most part of the speech, he's supposed to be telling us why he and Desdemona are together, and he ends up giving us this long speech about why we all should like him, what hero worship we should have for him. What's interesting, too, again, is the choice of words that Shakespeare has. Again, watch for figurative language and description. The imagery that we have at the end here, the words greedy and devour are both quite animalistic word choices. It suggests that Desdemona is passionate, the opposite of the ideal demure Jacobean woman of the time. And so as we continue on through the Othello wooing Desdemona's speech, as we take a look at something such as beguiling her of her tears, does this mean that Othello intended to make Desdemona pity him? So when you're thinking about how he's trying to make the Duke and Brabantio woo over to his side to make them impressed with him, he sometimes lets us know that Desdemona, in spite of her saying that, yes, she's in love with him, you kind of wonder what feelings are actually coming from Desdemona. When he says, I did consent and often did beguile her of her tears when I did speak of some distressful stroke that my youth suffered, it sounds why perhaps he might not consider later in the play she might not be in love, more that she is looking to pity him, more that she's looking as a friendship or as a token of affection and not so much deep love. And so that's why we kind of question was he even questioning at the very beginning why the two of them were together? Is this why he might be so quick to distrust her later in the play? And so as we come through and start getting into 
uh, Othello's speech and asking, you know, go here comes the lady, let her witness it. As he finishes up his suggestion, we wonder if Desdemona means she wishes she was a man or that heaven would give her such a husband through Othello's point of view. He starts giving us her point of view. She swore in faith, twas strange, twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. She'd wished she'd not yet heard it, yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me and bade me if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story, and that would woo her. So he's looking over at her point of view, which is kind of an interesting take because perhaps he has misunderstood. And as he continues on, he says, upon this hint I spake, she loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. So is pity a secure foundation for marriage? And then lastly, we have at the very end of his Desdemona being wooed speech, he does say, here come the lady, let her witness it. He respectfully addresses Desdemona here and trusts her that she's going to support his story. So right afterwards, we have Desdemona declaring her love for Othello and to her father, Brabantio. He then turns around and warns Othello that he'll need to keep a close eye on Desdemona. Look to her more, if thou hast eyes to see. She hath deceived her father, and may thee. Ironically, Brabantio refers to Othello using his eyes to see, which is how Othello judges people in situations. However, towards the end of the play, when he judges Desdemona, he's so twisted by Iago's lies that he's unable to see the truth about Iago or about Desdemona. So this warning that comes from Brabantio is used later in the play by Iago as evidence of Desdemona's infidelity. And yet by the end of the act, Iago's soliloquy reveals to the audience some of his reasons for hating Othello. We've now spent quite a bit of time setting up the relationship of Desdemona and Othello, but we need to get back to Iago and distrusting him. Now Iago's willingness to act upon suspicion as if for surety suggests there's an inherent evil nature to his character, that the motives he gives are purely incidental. Now ironically, this is exactly what Iago is able to convince Othello to do, to change from being a man who judges by what he sees to judging by what he hears from others. So back to the character of Iago. He states, the more is of a free and open nature. That thinks men honest, but that seems to be so. So one of his evil characteristics is Iago's ability to see positive qualities, ones that Othello is proud of as a sign of weakness. Now the audience is aware that Iago sees this trait as a flaw. He sees it as making a person susceptible to being taken advantage of. So in this soliloquy, Iago expresses to the audience how he intends to take advantage of Othello by using his own trusting nature against him. Now, when Iago is talking to Rodrigo about winning back Desdemona from Othello in the previous uh, scene, he speaks in a fast-paced prose. But now in this soliloquy, when he's alone on stage, Iago returns to his blank verse. Now, this highlights Iago's ability to manipulate his style to suit his purpose and audience. Perhaps he was speaking in fast-paced prose prose to Rodrigo because he was trying to make Rodrigo follow along with him. This is my plan. This is what we're going to do. But now alone on the stage where he's just reflecting on his own, he turns back to a blank verse. He's thoughtful. He's careful at what he tells us. So when we look at Iago's soliloquy, he reveals his plan of fooling Rodrigo of tricking Othello into believing Cassio is pursuing Desdemona and justifying that their honest nature will lead them to their destruction. He's hoping to destroy the idea of Cassio being a lieutenant and he's hoping to destroy Othello and Desdemona's marriage and he's going to use Rodrigo in order to do it. So we have Iago being the manipulative speaker here who plans to destroy all of the characters he describes and Rodrigo, because he's so much in love with Desdemona, he decides to trust Iago's honesty and takes his advice wholeheartedly as a friend.
So when we look at some of the lines of Iago's soliloquy, when he compares his quote-unquote friend Rodrigo to an object only to pay him money as he continues to make false promises, Rodrigo is considered Iago's purse here. Thus do I ever make my fool my purse. Rodrigo, do not trust Iago. He doesn't even consider you as a friend. As he continues on, he's got to move away from the idea of Rodrigo and move back into how he's going to go after Othello. And it's very direct and very simple. I hate the Moor. He uses a very direct and powerful verb, hate, to open his argument, suggesting his simple motives that will be concealed by complicated lies and evil plans. It's interesting that he's so, so very simply telling us his thought, I hate the Moor, knowing that it's going to take several acts in order for us to see his plan being concocted and enacted out. This use of this direct verb is also Iago's way of telling us his plan to destroy openly, but only after his plans have come to fruition do we realize the early revelation of his plan in Act 1. Now his inner motive comes immediately afterwards. I hate the moor, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he has done my office. So we have this inner motive to take down Othello by stating his belief that Othello can sleep with anybody, and so he's even in the belief that Othello has slept with his own wife, Amelia. So his office is Iago's sexual duty to Amelia, and he believes that Othello has now taken over. So in other words, Iago wants to his ranking, his office, back from Othello. So not only is he upset by Othello surpassing Michael Cassio over him in his job, but he doesn't even trust Othello near his wife, Amelia. As he finishes up, we have, but I, for mere suspicion of that kind, will do as if for surety. He holds me well. The better shall my purpose work on him. Othello trusts Iago. His belief that he's honest and reliable make it easier for Iago to manipulate him, taking advantage of Othello's good nature. As we continue on, we also have to remember we're not just here to destroy Othello and Desdemona's marriage. He also wants to destroy Michael Cassio, who has superseded him into becoming a lieutenant. So when he starts off by saying, Cassio's a proper man, we have this double meaning of being both attractive and physical attributes, as well as an attractive target for Iago to base his plan upon. He says, let me see now, to get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery. How? How? So he reminds us what it is that he's trying to do in order to take down Cassio. And then he continues on back into Othello, and where he's going to compare Othello to an animal that will follow wherever it's led regardless, just like Othello will trust Iago even without evidence. He states, The moor is of a free and open nature, and thinks men honest, but that seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is engendered. Hell and night must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light. So he personifies his plan as a birth that's going to take place. All of his intentions and plans are about to start. However, the imagery of hell and monstrous birth also foreshadow the incredibly dark and disturbing events that are about to unfold. So when you look at Iago's soliloquy, as he goes through his thought process of the plans that are going to be happening over the next couple of acts, he describes each character and justifies why it's going to work and why the characters are ideal victims for him. For example, in the first ideal, he has how he's talking, uh, taking advantage of Rodrigo's money. Now remember, he's taking Rodrigo's money in the hopes that he can get somehow Desdemona back to Rodrigo, and that's how Rodrigo is going to help. In this next part, he says he reveals his hatred for Othello and the cause which will foreshadow the exact actions of how his plan will play out. In the next part, Iago reveals how he will use Cassio for his plan's fruition in order to break up Othello and Desdemona. And in the next part, Iago discusses why each of these characters are ideal for the success of his plan. And then lastly, Iago states the result of his plan and justifies its inevitable success. So not only is he giving us a little bit of a recitative, he's trying to give us the information that tells us what's about to happen. He's also giving us a great sense of his character, how his character has thought all of these plans out, why he thinks they're going to work, 
and then eventually states the result of his plan. He knows it's going to work. That gives us a lot of sense of the character really thinking he knows his stuff. So when we compare Othello's and Iago's language, because in this scene you have two different speeches, you can see Othello is this very open, emotional, descriptive guy. You can see that he's using dignified blank verse, and a lot of the imagery and language reflect high and lofty ideals. He's a very much of a heroic language type. He's powerful, he's dramatic. The images that know no bounds, he talks about sky and heaven and hell and death and fate. Iago's speech, his soliloquy at the end, is completely the opposite. Whereas Othello is very descriptive and emotional, Iago is very cunning and very manipulative. Where we have this bombastic, lofty language from Othello, Iago is very straightforward. His imagery is terse, it's dry. I hate the Moor. Where we have these lofty ideals and this heroic language being used, we have images of base physical functions, images of money and depravity. It's very anti-heroic language coming from Iago. Now, what is interesting is even though you have a very positive, bombastic feeling, a heroic kind of feeling from Othello, and a very negative, anti-heroic language coming from Iago, Othello's language becomes chaotic more and more throughout the play, whereas Iago remains in control of his language throughout the play. Eventually, you're going to see fragments and obscenities and violent outbursts coming from the character of Othello, where you're going to see Iago, on the other hand, question, accuse, hint, insinuate. He's in complete control of his language. Other similarities as we look ahead into Act Two and beyond, Othello's language starts to become more depraved as his jealousy grows, and then he even starts to use Iago's imagery. Remember, Iago is directing him into what he's thinking, so he starts taking on the thoughts of Iago. Now, both characters use images of war and soldiers. After all, they are both soldiers. And Othello sees the glory of war, while Iago views war as an economic venture. He can gain something out of it. This shows Othello's natural hero for courage and idealism being very much in contrast to Iago's self-interested character. And that will end our Act 1. Thank you so much for stopping by on the channel. As always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe. And please continue on with my playlist if you want to see more of Othello. Thanks for stopping by.